Meet Boris Johnson, British politician and stunt double for Jeff Daniels in Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> now, many of you might be hearing about him for the first time, but in Britain, he's a household name. Alexander Boris de Pfeffel Johnson is the only British politician known universally by a first name. Boris. He began his career as a journalist. Johnson spent eight years as mayor of London, always willing to perform for the cameras. Johnson struck political gold when Britain hosted the 2012 Olympics. He gained praise for steering London smoothly through the event. There were a few embarrassing moments for Johnson, most notably when he got stuck on a zip wire. Get me a ladder. Oh, man, that is so embarrassing. He's stuck on a zip line up there. I guess at the same time, though, it's probably good preparation for handling Brexit, you know? It's just a, oh, boy, how do I get out of this? Any ideas? Any ideas? I thought it would be much easier. So Boris was the mayor of London and a character who did things that made people laugh. But just like Trump, he also gained a reputation for his trash talk. Boris Johnson has refused to bow to calls from all sides to apologize for saying women who wear face veils look like bank robbers and letterboxes. Johnson also blasted the president's decision to move a bust of Winston Churchill from the Oval Office. He called it, quote, a symbol of the part Kenyan president's ancestral dislike of the British Empire. He described Hillary Clinton as having, quote, dyed blonde hair, pouty lips, and a steely blue stare, like a sadistic nurse in a mental hospital. This on President Putin. Despite looking a bit like Dobby the house elf, he is a ruthless and manipulative tyrant. Okay. I honestly can't believe he said those things about Muslim women and Hillary Clinton, but... You do have to admit, <laughs> Vladimir Putin does look like Dobby. <laughs> I mean, he does. You know, it looks like Dobby got a job at KPMG. Like, look at him. <laughs> but still, but still, it's pretty ballsy for Boris to make fun of someone for looking like a Harry Potter character when he looks like a midlife crisis Malfoy. I mean... <laughs> Like, he looks like Malfoy got addicted to potions and he's been trying to sustain his habit ever since. <laughs> and despite his controversial quotes, Boris has continued to rise in British politics. In fact, after serving as London's mayor, he joined Parliament and became a prominent voice for one of the biggest blunders in British political history, Brexit. The Leave campaign, which says Europe costs too much and controls too much, has been led by former London Mayor Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson believes he owns the victory. Vote Leave, my friends. Vote Leave. I believe that this Thursday can be our country's Independence Day. When you look at the EU now, it makes me think of some, of some badly designed undergarment. That, is, that has now become too tight in some places. <laughs> far too tight, far too constrictive, and dangerously loose in, in other places. What? Forget Brexit. What's going on with this dude's underwear, man? <laughs> like, did he forget to take off that zipline harness? Is that what happened there? It's almost like he was so distracted by his uncomfortable underwear that it just, like, snuck into his speech. He's like, my friends, Britain is like a, a wedgie being pulled deeper and deeper into the butt crack of the European Union. And, uh, you know, squeezing with the testicles tight against my body, which was enjoyable at first, but has become extremely, extremely uncomfortable ever since. Now, if you excuse me, I'm headed to the bathroom to save the testes that I have remaining. <laughs> now, here's what's crazy. Here's what's crazy. Before the Brexit vote, Boris lied to voters in Britain about the benefits of leaving the EU. And now that Theresa May has taken most of the Brexit backlash, he might get her job. But he's part of the reason that she's losing it, huh? And you thought the patriarchy was dying, baby, huh? <laughs> we need to throw a patriarchy parade. I'll see you guys in Boston, yeah! <laughs> to understand what's going on in Sudan right now, you have to go back 30 years. When Sudan got something that almost always guarantees oppression and unrest, a dictator. 
Omar al-Bashir came to power in a military coup in 1989 and survived for 30 years through cunning and brutality. In southern Sudan and Darfur, his militias scorched earth and massacred his enemies. Hundreds of thousands died and suffered from famine. He was indicted for war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. Since 1989, 75-year-old Omar al-Bashir forcibly united Sudan by waging wars while wearing a smile. You know, the only thing worse than a dictator is a smiling dictator. Yeah, because now you're a maniac with a creepy-ass grin. Like, we all know how terrifying Hitler looks. Now imagine if he was smiling. Yeah, I, I can't look at that. Take that shit down. Take that shit down. So for 30 years, Omar al-Bashir ruled over Sudan with an iron fist. And there were many failed attempts to overthrow him. But it turns out the secret ingredient to a successful revolt was bread. The protest began in December 2018 in the city of Agbara. The sudden tripling of the cost of bread sparked the initial protests, but they quickly turned into anti-government rallies, calling for the resignation of al-Bashir. After 30 years in power, President Omar al-Bashir has been forced out of power by the country's military. The army has dissolved the government and declared a state of emergency. That's right, after 30 years in power, this dictatorship ended because people didn't have bread which must be really confusing to people in California. Yeah, because they start riots if you give them bread. <laughs> like, this doesn't have carbs, right? Because if it does, I will burn this <laughs> store to the ground! <laughs> so, two months ago, the people of Sudan finally got rid of their dictator, and you could tell that it was a big deal because people were cheering online, celebrating in town squares, and even partying in the streets. I mean, just look at that joy, huh? People were dancing in the traffic. It's like an African La La Land. <laughs> but just like La La Land's joy at the Oscars, the people of Sudan's victory were short-lived. Sudan's defense minister said the military is suspending the constitution and will take charge of the country for the next two years. One week after they deposed a dictator, Sudanese demonstrators are still on the streets. They too want to replace a military-led regime they consider corrupt with a civilian-led government. That is such a horrible and unfortunate twist. The military helped the people depose the dictator, and then they decided to take his place, yeah, which is a classic Lord of the Rings. Yeah, Gollum works with the good guys to get rid of the ring, and at the end, when he sees an opening, he's like, my precious! <laughs> so, now you know the basics of what happened. The people of Sudan got rid of their dictator of 30 years, and now, right now, they're fighting the military general who wants to be their dictator for the next 30 years. And you may be wondering, yeah, but Trevor, how are celebrities gonna help, huh? Is the general gonna check Twitter and be like, oh no, Rihanna blocked me, I'll step down. <laughs> well, maybe not, maybe not. But already the awareness campaign is bearing fruit. The US is sending a special envoy to Sudan and the African Union has suspended Sudan until the military gives power back to the people. Yeah. And it's not just up to celebrities to shine a light on this. Any American can help. You can call your congressperson and you can urge them to keep the pressure on Sudan. You can actually make a difference, which is especially important today because it's World Refugee Day. Because while not everyone may agree on what to do with refugees, I think we can all agree that no one should have to become one in the first place. We begin this evening with a dangerously close call on the high seas between a Russian destroyer and a U.S. warship. Those ships coming within feet of one another, forcing the Americans to take drastic action to avoid a disastrous collision. This image capturing just how close the ships came to a catastrophic collision. As little as 50 feet, according to the U.S. Navy. This video from the deck of the USS Chancellorsville showing the Russian destroyer was so close, you could see Russian sailors sunbathing on the deck. Sweet Lord. <laughs> Russians are hardcore. You realize these ships are about to crash into each other. American soldiers, soldiers are like, prepare for breach! And the Russian soldiers are like, Dimitri, take off your shirt. <laughs> Let's get suntan before we die, yeah. <laughs> Don't want to meet Jesus' as pasty bitch. <laughs> but this is pretty crazy, man. <laughs> this is pretty crazy. A Russian warship basically tried to ram into an American ship in the middle of the ocean. Right. And let's be honest, that had to be on purpose. Right. What other excuse is there? Do you know how big the ocean is? You have to really go out of your way to collide with someone. It's like walking into someone at Ted Cruz's birthday party. There's no one else there. <laughs> you did it on purpose. 
Now the question is, the question is, where would Russia get the balls to play chicken against America in the Pacific? Well, maybe it's because they've got a new and powerful BFF. Just as President Trump was meeting with America's most important allies in Europe, two of America's biggest adversaries were holding court in Moscow. It was a split screen tailor-made by Russian President Vladimir Putin. Putin hosted Chinese President Xi Jinping. Xi calling Putin his, quote, best and bosom friend, saying he cherished their deep friendship. The two enjoying a leisurely boat ride in St. Petersburg yesterday. That's right. Xi and Putin have gotten so close They're even taking boat rides together. And not just a normal boat ride. Putin even helped Xi recreate that scene from Titanic. He was like, yeah, I'm king of the world! No, really, China's taking over the world! (laughs) So it's clear, China and Russia are really hitting it off because you only take a boat ride with someone if you really, really like them or if they're enslaving you. But this is liking. (laughs) Oh, and if, if you think Putin giving Xi a boat ride is impressive, wait until you see what Xi gave Putin in return. The leader's visit also includes some panda diplomacy. During their summit, Putin and Xi showed off their friendship with a visit to the Moscow Zoo, where they welcomed two new Chinese pandas, a gift from Xi to Russia. I mean, China likes you. One of the signs of that, you know, good good alliance and good feelings is to present you with a panda. Russia got two. That's right. China gave not one, but two pandas to Russia, which is huge. Yeah, because one panda can't make babies. Two pandas also can't, but there's hope. (laughs) And remember, China only gives pandas to countries when they wish to be close allies with them, right? They actually call it panda diplomacy. This is a real thing, panda diplomacy. Not to be confused with panda express diplomacy, (laughs) where I convinced them to let me use the bathroom even though I didn't buy anything. (laughs) And technically, this is interesting, technically China didn't give Russia the pandas, right? The Russians just get to keep the pandas for a few years, yes which, by the way, applies to every panda in the world. Yeah, China owns every single panda at the world. So at some point, they have to go home. And I guess it's because China doesn't want the pandas forgetting their Chinese roots. Imagine if you let a panda stay in New Jersey for too long, huh? (laughs) Yeah, then when the panda gets back to China, it's like, hey, what the is this bamboo? Hey, how about some gabagool or a nice fettuccine? Marone! (laughs) Anyway, I could talk about pandas all day, but the point is, China and Russia are getting super close. And the consequences for America go beyond boat rides and cute bears. While Russia and China continue to strengthen their economic ties, they're also expanding their military cooperation. Chinese troops taking part in massive drills with Russian forces last year. The level of cooperation between Russia and China has not been this high since the mid-1950s. They are combining forces against us. They say Russia and China can coordinate cyber attacks and military moves that can knock U.S. forces off balance. Oh, man, China and Russia teaming up against the United States? I mean, America could probably handle China or Russia, but not both at the same time. Like, imagine if in Rocky IV, Ivan Drago was fighting, and then Jackie Chan jumped in the ring to help him. (laughs) Huh? That would be the end of Rocky. It would be done. There'd be no Rocky V, no Rocky Balboa, no Rocky Goes to Space, no Rocky and the Sorcerer's Stone, and definitely no Fifty Shades of Rocky. None of those movies. Now, beyond geopolitics, the personal elements of this bromance is probably something that's gonna bug Donald Trump. Because don't forget, he wants to be a part of this club. He loves those dudes. We know how much he admires Putin. He talks all the time about he and Xi Jinping are great friends. (laughs) So to see his two besties make plans without him, that's, that's gotta hurt. (laughs) Yeah, and I don't think that he's dealing with his feelings in the most mature way. The U.S. President Donald Trump is threatening new tariffs on another $300 billion in Chinese goods. This if President Xi Jinping doesn't meet with him at the upcoming G20 summit. Wow, really, Trump? (laughs) He's gonna put tariffs on China if Xi doesn't hang out with him? (laughs) That is so childish. If you don't come over to my house and play video games, then tariffs. And I get to be player one the whole time. And what is it with Trump using tariffs in every legal situation? Have you guys noticed this? In every situation, Trump is using tariffs now, right? Illegal immigration, tariffs on Mexico. Xi Jinping won't have a play date, tariffs on China. Melania won't hold his hand in public, tariffs on Slovakia. (laughs) But Donald, I'm from Slovenia. I don't care, pronounce it anyway, still tariffs. (laughs) So look, it's clear what's happening here. 
President Trump, you're feeling neglected by President Xi. But instead of lashing out, why not work on your relationship, man? You know, forget tariffs, maybe talk to Xi. Tell him how you're feeling. And if that doesn't work, try and spice things up, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Dress up as something you know China's really into. Yeah. (laughs) Who could resist? For as long as white people have been colonizing Africa, trophy hunting has existed as a way for them to bring home souvenirs. And you know, in a way, I feel like us Africans are partly to blame. We should have had a gift shop. We should have had (laughs) a gift shop. But while these pictures may have garnered praise in the 1900s, these days, thanks to social, social media, the only thing that they generate is outrage. In recent years, the hunting of big cats has sent shockwaves around the globe. Outrage in this country over the killing of a beloved lion in Zimbabwe by an American hunter. This photo from an African trophy hunt has sparked outrage across the country. That same fire reignited when a trophy hunting couple posed kissing over the corpse of a lion they had just slain. Like... I'm sorry, man, this is, this is just disgusting. You killed an animal for fun and then you make out next to its dead body? Is this, is this like a fetish? <laughs> no, I honestly wonder this. Like, like, is this like a thing just for lions or do they do this every time there's a dead animal? Like, like every time they see roadkill on the highway, <laughs> is this couple just like, honey, pull over. I'm so turned on right now. <laughs> it's also disrespectful. Like, imagine if it happened the other way around, yeah? Like, at a family funeral, all of a sudden, just, like, two lions popped out and started humping at your dad's coffin, just like... (laughs) Yeah, you wouldn't be happy with that. (laughs) And what's interesting, what's interesting about trophy hunting is that we all assume people do it because they don't care about the animals, but according to the hunting community, they do this because they care too much. I know it sounds contradictory, but... Hunters love animals. Hunters are the ones that are giving so much back to preserving these wild species. A lot of people talk about conservation, but hunters are the real um, conservationists. Everybody thinks that the easiest part is pulling the trigger, and it's not. That's the hardest part. But you gain so much respect and so much appreciation for that animal. Wow, that's one hell of a way to show your appreciation and respect. Imagine if your boss called you into his office and was like, Johnny, I want to let you know how much I appreciate and respect your hard work. And that's why it's my privilege. (laughs) And by the way, did you notice how that other woman arranged her lions? Like, did you see that? I don't care if you hunt or not, that's just creepy. (laughs) Like, look at that. It it looks like she shot the lions and then said, make it look like they're about to have sex. (laughs) And then make that deer look like it's watching. (laughs) Now, oh. Another argument trophy hunters use is that they're actually getting rid of the slower, weaker animals who are holding back the rest of the herd. But that might not be the full story. Trophy hunters kill some of the biggest, most magnificent animals, which is bad for the health of the species because genes may no longer be passed on to future generations. By taking those guys out of the gene pool, it weakens the genes of the entire population. So over the last 30 years, the average size of a male lion has dropped specifically because of trophy hunting. That's right, despite what they say, trophy hunters actually like to target the strongest specimens, which I don't support, but honestly, I mean, I understand. It's called trophy hunting for a reason. Yeah, you want it to look like you battled an alpha male to the death, not like you snuck into its nursing home and then smothered one of the lions with a pillow, just like, shh. Go to sleep, Scar, go to sleep. (laughs) Actually, if you think about it, this is the one time in the animal kingdom where it pays to be out of shape. Like, I wonder if there's one fat-ass lion who's just like, yeah, who's laughing now? (laughs) No one asked me to the prom, but at least I'm not in a picture with Don Jr. (laughs) (laughs) And one of the main arguments, one of the main arguments trophy hunters give is that their hobby helps local villagers. But upon closer inspection, That's not necessarily true. Critics question whether countries that promote trophy hunts manage that money properly. A 2013 report found that just 3% of hunting revenue ends up in local communities. In Zimbabwe, corruption and bloated bureaucracy prevent much of the money from helping those in need. How much money does the community get at the moment? We are getting nothing. Absolutely nothing. Yeah, you see, the truth is, unfortunately, the money from these hunts 
doesn't go to these communities. Oftentimes, it stays at the top with the people who run the trophy hunting game. To be honest, most of these claims don't add up for me, you know, because another thing hunters love to say is it's not just the money. They always say that their hunting provides meat for the local villagers. Yeah, because apparently before the white hunters came, all Africans could do was just look at the animals. <laughs> yeah, Africans were just like, oh, look at the meat inside that buffalo, huh? <laughs> if only there was a way to get inside it, ah. I guess we'll just have to wait for the white man to show up one day, ah, huh? one day. <laughs> so that's trophy hunting in a nutshell. And as weak as the arguments for it may seem, there will always be people who are convinced that it's actually a good thing. Which made us think, if it's working so well for Africa, maybe it's only fair that we let America enjoy some of those benefits. Dear America, for the past few decades, you have come to Africa to shoot our animals. And you say you do this to help us. And we are so grateful, we want to return the favor. You see all of these stray dogs and cats that are running across your country? I'm going to kill them. That's right. As part of a new program, rich Africans will pay to hunt stray dogs and cats in America. And for every dog we shoot, a portion of the profits will go to American communities. Up to 3%. And I know what you are thinking. What about my pets? I'm going to kill them too. Yes, pets that have reached old age will also be hunted by rich Africans. No more watching Fluffles struggle to climb the stairs. Instead, Fluffles will be shot and mounted in a Nigerian's man cave. And here's the best part. After we shoot the dog, we will donate the carcass so that no more American children go without school lunch. It's a win-win. Oh, what a cute dog. You get a head start. Oh, I'm going to kill it. As Nigerians struggled with high crime rates in the 90s, the government decided that the best solution would be to create a special police unit who could do whatever they wanted to stop crime. But as you might expect, things didn't go as planned. It's a unit that was set up in the 90s. Uh, the initial purpose of it was to deal with armed robberies, cattle rustling, um, and other violent thefts. They were given a special remit initially not needing to wear uniforms, acting as a sort of faceless security force. Over time, essentially, they use their autonomy to be able to move around very freely, set up roadblocks, but they were definitely became the kind of more brutal face of the police, eventually being accused of extrajudicial killings, torture, corruption, and robbery. Many Nigerians essentially see SARS as a replica of the very criminal groups they were set up to address. Okay, I'm not gonna lie, that's a plot twist I did not see coming. The good guys who were supposed to stop the bad guys eventually became worse than the bad guys? I mean, I suppose that is one way to end crime. You just take over the crime for yourself. That would be like if you got a dog to protect your house, but then woke up in the middle of the night and the dog's got a gun pointed at your face like, <laughs> be a good boy and nobody gets hurt. And I know what some of you might be saying right now. Well, if these Nigerians would just obey the law, then they wouldn't have to worry about the SARS police. Well, unfortunately, obeying the law doesn't help when just existing is considered a crime. There has been a policing culture that targets uh, young Nigerian youths that are perhaps seen in flashy cars, and these are seen as uh, internet uh, fraudsters. Because they see you know, young people looking good or young people dressing a type of way, they just automatically feel this guy is a criminal. You are profiled if you have dreads, if you have tattoos, if you're wearing tight clothes, if you have an iPhone. I've been evicted two times in just one year, two times because of my iPhone. And that is the first question they ask you, where's your phone? I'm a woman. I come back at night. Police will be telling me that where did I get money to buy my vehicle? They'll call me prostitute. We cannot do that. I want to add for my money, man. How can you see somebody on the road and you pick them up and they are criminals just by looking at them? Maybe I look fresh, all of a sudden I'm, I'm, I'm stealing. Yes, SARS would arrest people for simply dressing well or having an iPhone. And to have the police arresting people for their clothing choices must be so confusing. Because on the one hand, it is horrible to be harassed by the police for how you look. On the other hand, it's also kind of a compliment. And if they don't arrest you, then you'll be like, wait, hold on, what's, 
What's wrong with my outfit? You guys didn't pull me over. But the most surprising aspect of this for me is that people are getting profiled as criminals just for having an iPhone, which is insane. Criminals don't use iPhones, they use flip phones. Everybody knows this. If you need a phone that you might have to toss down a sewer while the cops are after you, you don't spring for 5G. But this just goes to show that this issue isn't unique in the US. Whether it's American police targeting black Americans or Nigerian police targeting other Nigerians, police in many countries around the world know that they can abuse their power without ramifications because the people they harass don't have the power to respond. But after years of police brutality, Nigerians have responded. They've taken to the streets over the last few weeks to say that enough is enough. Unfortunately, the police response to these peaceful protests has been all too familiar. We are seeing acts of police brutality on protesters uh, um, demonstrating peacefully. Protesters dispersed by officers with water cannons, tear gas. Live ammunition was used to disperse protesters against police brutality. What is paramount to us is law and order. There must be law and order in whatever we are doing. You know, it's amazing how around the world, law and order seems to be code for, let's beat the shit out of these protesters. Because just like we've seen in the US, the police in Nigeria responded to protests about police brutality with more police brutality. And this is the kind of behavior that you only see with police. No other industry has this. Imagine complaining to your waiter that there's something wrong with your food and he responds by spitting in it right in front of you. I mean, I'm still gonna eat it because what kind of monster wastes Benihana, but best believe I'm not holding back in my Yelp review. Three stars max. Now the good news is the protests worked and all the pressure paid off. In fact, the Nigerian government announced that they would cancel the SARS unit with immediate effect. The bad news is they already have a spin-off in the works. The Nigerian Inspector General and the entire world have heard those chants of end SARS, and now the country is dissolving its controversial special anti-robbery squad known as SARS. A rebranded Nigerian police unit called Special We and Tactics, or SWAT, has been organized and includes members of that disbanded group. The campaigners here are calling the decision to abolish uh, SARS a hollow victory. And they say that they will continue protesting. They're out on the streets this morning. They say these are just words and they are demanding action. This is, after all, the fourth time that this very same unit has been disbanded and nothing has changed. We do not want them to say they are banned. They was banned 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020. But now we are saying end to SARS. Okay, hold up, hold up, hold up. How are you going to disband the corrupt unit, but then rehire the same officers under a different name? That makes absolutely no sense. That would be like if someone had a nightmare child who was like burned their furniture. And then instead of actually dealing with the problem, the parent was like, okay, I've had it, Jaden. Enough of this. From now on, your name is Brian. All right, here's some matches. Have a good time. I think we solved that. So despite the government cracking down, protesters have remained in the streets and are now demanding wholesale reforms in all parts of Nigerian life. And as we saw just today, the police crackdown is only becoming more violent. But what started as a police protest has now turned into a call for a social revolution. Nigerians now want more jobs, better schools, better infrastructure, and an end to all corruption, which is what hashtag NSARS has now become. What exactly is the big deal about 5G? Because you might think it's just 4G, but a little bit faster, but it's actually a lot faster. So fast, in fact, that it could change the world. The new world of 5G technology promises to transform our lives, connecting millions of devices and enabling everything from driverless cars to smart homes. Up to 20 times faster than the 4G most of us use now, 5G's lightning fast technology will accelerate and interconnect everything. To download a two hour film on 3G would take about 26 hours. On 4G, you'd be waiting six minutes. And on 5G, you'll be ready to watch your film in just over three and a half seconds. Damn, you could download an entire movie in three seconds. 
That's going to be fast. I mean, we'll still spend 45 minutes trying to decide which movie to download. <laughs> but once we've decided, we'll need to go to bed because we're tired. <laughs> but tomorrow, three seconds, my friends. And 5G isn't just about download speeds. It's a game changer for everything. Like, with 5G, you can have cities where everything communicates. Like, doctors can perform surgeries from the other side of the world. Can you imagine a world where your videos never buffer, right? Your calls never drop. That would be amazing. Except, I guess, now you could never fake a call dropping with 5G. (laughs) Yeah, because that excuse is gone. You'd be like, ah, I'm I'm losing, I'm losing, you're breaking up. And be like, mother you're not breaking up, we got 5G! Be like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Carry on, grandma. (laughs) Yes, my grandma is Samuel L. Jackson. So... (laughs) So, look, there's no denying. The technology is great. But why do China and the U.S. care so much about who makes it? Well, it's the same reason they care about anything. The Benjamins, baby. When the U.S. won the 4G race earlier this decade, it provided a nearly $100 billion boost to gross domestic product. And the stakes of the 5G race are even higher. If the U.S. wins, it would create an estimated 3 million jobs and add approximately $500 billion to GDP. That's right. If America wins the 5G race, that could bring millions of jobs and $500 billion to the country's GDP. $500 billion. You know how hard it is to get $500 billion? Like, you'd have to marry and divorce Jeff Bezos five times. (laughs) And I mean, after the fourth time, he'd probably catch on. He'd be like... I think you don't love me. What, me, Jeff? (laughs) And the fight about 5G isn't just about money and downloading Avengers like that. No, it's also about power. Because if you control 5G, you have access to everything people are doing online, which is everything. And right now, the best 5G technology is made by a Chinese company called Huawei. And because the Chinese company is Chinese, Many governments don't trust how secure it's gonna be. Huawei may be best known to most people for making phones, but it's also a leading player in building the infrastructure for all our communications. Critics fear that allowing it to build 5G could enable the Chinese state to spy on or even switch off the flow of data we will all depend on. Imagine that. If Huawei becomes the leading 5G provider in the world, then China can spy on everyone, which is terrible because that's what America wants to do. (laughs) Yeah, and I know you're judging, well, if America wants to do it, then how do they judge it? It's not, that's not the point, right? You want to do it first. It's like when you cut someone off in traffic and then someone else cuts in front of you, you're like, hey, asshole, that was my move! (laughs) But those are the stakes. Job, money, and power. And I'm not gonna try and bore you with all the technical details, but while America is developing its own 5G, China's 5G is so far ahead. Like, they're basically gonna set the trends. It's like how back in the day, there used to be a fight between DVD and Laserdisc. Yeah, and if you're wondering, what the hell is Laserdisc exactly? Yeah, (laughs) that's America's 5G. So this is a race many people are already saying America has lost. Luckily, and I can't believe I'm saying this, America is lucky that you have a maniac on your team who's willing to play dirty. President Trump has signed an executive order banning U.S. companies from using telecom equipment deemed to be a national security threat. And that's a direct shot at China and its tech giant Huawei. As the U.S. clamped down on the company causes a major domino effect. The U.K.'s biggest mobile network pulling Huawei from its 5G launch, while three of Japan's mobile operators have stopped taking orders or delayed the summer release of a new Huawei phone. Donald J. Mother effing Trump. (laughs) This guy could see America wasn't gonna win, so he just got a crowbar and pulled a Tonya Harding on China's 5G. (laughs) Just went in straight there. Yeah. The man might not know what 5G is, but he does know how to mess up other people's shit. Just in there. (laughs) Bam! And I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't actually blame Donald Trump because I don't know how else America can win this race. Because even if America does manage to cripple Huawei and China, it's not like America will suddenly have great 5G, right? You won't just have 5G overnight. Unless America just pretends that it does. AT&T is putting a fake 5G logo on iPhones and iPads now. The company confirmed to PC Magazine that the new icon's gonna show up when users download 
Apple's latest beta version of iOS 12.2, but it's not really 5G. AT&T just changed the name for its 4G LTE Advanced Network to 5G-E. The E stands for evolution. Okay, guys, that, that's really sad. at and is just gonna lie and put another stick. Like, it's like you have a, f a smart car and then you just tape Lamborghini on the side of it. <laughs> just check it out, man. I'm driving a Lambo now, zero to 60 in four minutes, flat. <laughs> but, seeing as it's a race that might be lost, at and might be onto something here because this is considered the new space race. So maybe, America can win this race the same way it won the last one. Just fake it, baby.